And our final uh, student speaker will be Bo Xiao Li, who's a PhD candidate in the Energy Resources Engineering Department at Stanford. He's focused on bridging the gap between uh, small scale uh, heterogeneities and reservoir scale simulation in order to better predict uh, long term fate of sequestered CO2. Um, also awarded the Frank G. Miller, Miller Fellowship, uh, and he's been one of the student representatives at Stanford to help uh, build this program uh, and others associated with GSEP. So welcome, Bo Xiao. Okay, thank you, Sally, for your introduction, and thank you for GSEP for giving me this opportunity to present some of my research to all of you. So. Um, I don't think I need to motivate why uh, CO2 sequestration is important. It is one of the most effective ways to reduce anthropogenic CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. So after CO2 is captured from sources like power plants, it is transported to and injected into the underground geological formations. So in this research, we focus on sequestration in saline aquifers because they are widely distributed around the world and they have a big sequestration capacity. So in order to accurately predict CO2 migration in the, in the saline aquifer, we need accurate simulations. So the flow of CO2 and water occur in the tiny pore spaces in the formation rock. Now, however, it is intractable to model a large aquifer by tracing fluid migration in the tiny pore spaces because there are numerous pores in an aquifer. So Darcy's law, based on continuum assumption, was developed so that people can use that to model flow in porous media at a larger scale, like, like the core scale. Now the core scale is very important because we can collect these cores from drilling and then perform high resolution, accurate, and affordable measurement at core scale to reveal the physics. However, it is still computationally unachievable to model a large aquifer based on core scale because you may need trillions of grid blocks to do that. So when we are modeling a large aquifer, the typical number of simulation grid blocks is around a million such that it is uh, computationally achievable, and each simulation grid block is on the order of 100 meters. But the challenge is that we cannot perform high resolution, accurate, and affordable measurement on such a large scale. So in order to accurately simulate a large scale aquifer, we need to uh, start and do rigorous study on a smaller scale which we can measure, and namely core scale, and then translate this important physics into a larger scale. However, in the common industry practice in translating from core to aquifer scale, people usually ignore the small scale heterogeneities inside the core. And this means that there are some important physics may be lost during this translation. So our goal is to bridge the gap and ensure and preserve a, uh, the important physics during the scale translation. So we ask ourselves several questions. Now, how do we model fluid flow in core scale? Basically, it means what's the physics in core scale flow? And how important is this small scale heterogeneity in a large scale simulation? And if it is important, how can we include it and you know, translate this important physics in large scale simulation? So our approaches are, we first perform core flood experiments to reveal the fluid flow and the physics in core scale. And then we perform high resolution simulations trying to reproduce the experimental results and then understand the core scale physics. And then we can use what we understand to study the impact on larger scale. So the core flood visualization lab we have at Stanford University in employs the X-ray CT imaging to accurately measure fluid distribution inside the core. And this is a typical experimental result. What I'm showing you here is the CO2 saturation distribution map inside the core measured by CT scanner. The definition of CO2 saturation is the volume fraction of the CO2 in the pore spaces. As you can see, as you can see the red color indicates the region where CO2 saturation is high, and the, in the, in the blue color indicates the region where CO2 saturation is low. And the CO2 saturation is, is distributing in a very heterogeneous manner. And we have experimental uh, evidence as well as simulation effort to, to say that uh, this is caused by spatial variation in the capillary pressure saturation relationship, also called capillary 
pluriheterogeneity. So this means that if we want to accurately model this core flood process, we need to account for capillary heterogeneity in our simulation. And however, performing these uh, core flood simulations are very difficult because first, it has high resolution. Now, this plot is a uh, typical simulation grid we use in our simulation. In this picture, we have over 50,000 grid blocks in there. So it's a very large model. And also we need to account for capillary heterogeneity. This means that each simulation grid block has its own capillary pressure curve. So in this plot, we have over 50,000 capillary pressure curves. So it's very complicated. And also the simulation time is very long. And we were able to perform this high resolution simulation using our previous simulator, TUF2. But each simulation took us roughly four days to finish in a computer cluster. So it's very slow. And also, we were not sure whether we were using the most effective numerical strategy. And neither were we sure that uh, the numerical approaches we use gave us the correct answer. So before we can study the scale translation problem and to you know, account for the small scale heterogeneity, we first need to have a rigorous mathematical and efficient numerical framework that models capillary heterogeneity correctly. So from a, physical, uh, from a numerical standpoint to model a physical process correctly, we need to honor three key elements. Mass conservation is honored for each simulation grid block as well as for the entire simulation domain. And the flux is continuous across each simulation grid block interfaces. And the flow direction at each grid block interface is correct. But the challenge of capillary heterogeneity is such that, first, the strong nonlinearity introduced by the capillary pressure term poses, I mean, it makes it very difficult to solve the mass conservation equations efficiently. And second, the discontinuity and the heterogeneity of the capillary pressure functions poses significant challenge in honoring flux continuity. And also the complicated interaction of viscous buoyancy and capillary pressure forces troubles the simulator to find out the correct flow direction. So we have identified and employed the correct numerical approaches that uh, to tackle these three challenges at the same time such that these three key elements are satisfied. And with that, we implemented the functionality of capillary heterogeneity inside our in-house simulator, the Stanford General Purpose Research Simulator, or GPRS. Each simulator has to be verified with a benchmark. Now, fortunately, we have a simple benchmark problem of capillary heterogeneity that has a semi-analytical solution. So the model composed, uh, is composed of two regions with different capillary pressure curve. The initial saturation distribution for the two regions are very different, and they are shown in this, in this picture. And now starting from this initial saturation, the semi-analytical solution depicts the change of saturation distribution uh, over time. And as we can see, due to capillary heterogeneity, there is a saturation jump across the region interface, and we need to, uh, we need to capture that in our simulation. So our simulator, GPRS, produces the simulation results shown by the circles, and they match the uh, semi analytical solution very well. And particularly, it is able to capture the saturation jump across the interface. So this means that our simulator is doing the right thing so that we can use that to model our core flop process. So here I show you some of the uh, results. What I'm showing you here is the CO2 saturation distribution map taken from an arbitrary cross-section across the core. And I am comparing the simulation results versus the CT scanning results measured in the experiment. Now, please pay attention to the pattern of how CO2 is distributed inside the core, and also pay attention to the value of CO2 saturation depicted by the colors. If you can compare these two plots, and you can see they actually match each other pretty well. And if you plot these two data sets together, the correlation is indeed very good. So this is telling us our simulation has very good accuracy. It is able to capture the pattern as well as the, as well as the value of CO2 saturation distribution that is consistent with the physics. And furthermore, the simulation time is, is greatly reduced. And previously, it took us four days in computer cluster. Now we spend uh, almost one hour to finish in a personal computer. So it's a very, uh, so it means that we now have a very efficient and robust numerical tool uh, for us to do a lot of things. 
Now, our, our next research uh, question becomes that uh, how important is this capillary heterogeneity in, in large-scale simulation? Now, if we look at the permeability distribution inside this particular rock, the first thing we may notice that there is a low permeability lamina running through the core. And our intuition uh, tells us that this low permeability lamina may be a, a flow barrier of CO2 that's going to affect uh, fluid migration significantly. And this is indeed the case. We have experimental results as well as this type of behavior is reported in the literature. However, in the remaining region of the core, although we do see heterogeneities in there, the heterogeneity appear to be relatively homogeneous, and it does not form any distinctive structure. Our intuition tells us initially that this relatively homogeneous heterogeneity may have very limited impact on fluid migration. However, this is not necessarily the case. If we look into this 2D, a vertical domain, one meter by one meter, and each simulation grid block is four by four millimeter square. And apparently this domain is, is relatively homogeneous, but if you look into the detail, you do see heterogene a heterogeneous distribution of permeability. And also each simulation grid block has its own capillary pressure curve, so it's also capillary heterogeneous. If we slowly inject CO2 from left to right to displace water, and the injection rate is, such, is slow such that it mimics the CO2 flow rate in the post-injection period. This is the simulation result of when we are considering capillary heterogeneity. As you can see, the, due to gravity, the CO2 tend to move upward and form a, a gravity ton. However, the advancement of the CO2 front is, is not that easy. CO2 encounters some local obstacles, that's, and that's why the displacement front is jagged. This means that the CO2 mobility is restricted by capillary heterogeneity. Now, if we keep all the simulation parameters unchanged, but ignore capillary heterogeneity by implementing a homogeneous capillary pressure function inside our simulation, uh, evaluated as the average of the, of the domain, this is the simulation result we get. And in this case, the CO2 mobility is much greater and is happy to move forward and upward and form a bigger gravity ton. And the plume extent of the CO2 plume is almost twice as large as the case when we are considering capillary heterogeneity. So this example tells us that uh, capillary heterogeneity is indeed very important, and we need to account for that. But the practical problem is that uh, in large-scale simulations, we cannot afford to implement so many capillary pressure curves inside our simulation. So we have to come up with some effective uh, multi-phase flow properties to use in our simulation. How do we calculate these effective properties while accounting for the impact of small-scale heterogeneity is our ongoing work and will continue to be our future research direction. So conclusions, uh, the small scale heterogeneity can be very important in large scale CO2 migration. And by performing core scale and sub core scale measurement and simulation, we are able to gather very valuable information about core scale physics and that can be used in translating into a larger scale simulation. Now we have this efficient and robust numerical tool that allows us to characterize small scale heterogeneity and also serve as a foundation of our understanding how do we translate this small-scale information into large-scale simulation. Uh, we are working on that right now and is continue going to be uh, in our future research direction. So finally, I would like to thank GSEP for financial support and would like to thank the entire team for their help. With that, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I know you're going to ask questions. <laughs> we, we would be disappointed. Well, you gave a very nice talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. A um, couple of questions. Actually, I have more to talk to you one on one. All right, sure. Uh, the, the, the picture that you showed where you actually match experiments with uh, uh -huh. populations, uh -huh. obviously, you adjusted something like a permeability or an entry capillary pressure at every grid block. In other words, you had a number of adjustable parameters, essentially, at least one per cell 
to match the experiment with the theory, probably two percent, right? Uh -huh. Well, I mean, uh, which plot are you talking about? The experiment? You got the experiment matched with the cross-sectional calculation. You had two circular cross uh, That one? Yes. Okay. So, obviously, you had two parameters at least adjusted in each grid block. Uh -huh. Which that match, right? Well, um, I, in terms of the simulation parameters, we, uh, uh, we calculate uh, basically the scaling of the capillary function is the J function scaling, and we measure that from the experiment. And then the per uh, porosity we measure from CT scanning, and the permeability we measure from, from, uh, from also CT scanning using, uh, using the, uh, uh, the approach developed in our group, Dr. Mike Krauss. So that's the simulation parameter we use in our simulation. But it's, but it's basically inferred through some indirect means for every grid block, permeability, entry, capillary pressure, and porosity. Uh -huh. I okay. So the other question is actually a more deep-rooted physics question, mm -hmm. uh, which is that when you look at the length scale on which you're introducing these capillary pressure functions, mm -hmm. you've got, you know, in a four millimeter by four, four millimeter cell, you've got subgrids and yeah. so on. Yeah. And then I start to ask, uh, do you actually even have a mean field approximation when capillary pressure varies and that kind of a length scale because you have something like hundreds of pores and to define a capillary pressure you need literally 10,000 to 100,000 pores mm -hmm. in order to have the correct mean scale, mean, scale, uh, mean field approximation. Yeah. So you are at a crossroads where you can't even define criterion properties anymore. Oh yeah, oh that's a very good question. I, I like I, I'm I'm very glad you mentioned that. And a lot of research a lot of researchers have done this, you know, what's the size of the representative elemental volume? I don't have the picture right now, but uh, there are a group of uh, uh, group of scholars have done that at least for Berea sandstone and other similar sandstone like Two millimeters or one millimeter is enough to be account for a uh, representative element of volume. It's reporting the literature, and uh, I can I can show you if you're interested. Yeah, I certainly agree with you on single phase flow, but I'm not sure about multi phase flow. Um, multi phase flow. Um, I'm not quite sure that uh, in that regard, or we can discuss later. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, one more question, and then we need to move on. Yeah. Any questions? No. Okay. All right, well, thank, okay. you. thank you very much.